will trust. You're my light in the darkness. You are Lord of my refuge. By your mercy, you cover me. By your mercy, you cover me. By your mercy, you cover me. I will never be the same. <laughs> Good morning, Southwest. Why don't we come on in? Let's, uh, let's all stand. <laughs> Sing about Jesus. I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him, I belong to Jesus, free from sin. I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him, I belong to Jesus, free from sin. He was lifted up, He paid a costly price. He bought me with the blood of His own life. Christ the King now reigning. He wears the victor's crown. Satan was defeated when the blood flowed down. I belong to I belong to Him, I belong to Jesus, free from sin. I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him, I belong to Jesus, free from sin. He was lifted up, He, was lifted up. he paid a costly price. He bought me with the blood of His own life. Christ the King now reigning. He wears the victor's crown. Satan was defeated when the blood flowed down. I belong to Him, Woo! I belong to Jesus, free from sin. I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him, I belong to Jesus, free from sin. Jesus, you're my firm foundation, I know I can stand to go. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful, mighty in power. 
God will deliver me. Of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. There is no other name known and by which we're saved. There is no other name. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. Every knee shall bow at his name. I belong to Jesus. I belong to him. I belong to Jesus, free from sin. I belong to Jesus, I belong to Him. I belong to Jesus, free from sin. People, we are free from sin. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church, uh, and welcome to Southwest. If you're a very first-time visitor, uh, we are so glad that you're here with us. Uh, please stick around, get to know us, let us get to know you. If you have any prayer requests of anyone, uh, please fill those out in the cards in front of you. And if any of you miss communion by chance on the way in, uh, raise your hand nice and high. We'll bring communion to you. If you miss communion, we have a couple. Uh, but again, it's just so wonderful to have you here with us. Uh, for this morning's installment of the Jim White Anything Exciting Happening Update, uh, I have two. Number one, not only is it Girl Scout cookie season, they have a new flavor called Raspberry Rally, which I am all about. So that's exciting. Uh, but more serious and more exciting than that is on Wednesday night, Kalia Sykes got baptized here, uh, which is so awesome. So amen and amen. <clears throat> yeah. uh, that is so exciting. Uh, so again, if you have any updates for me, any time, hit me up. I'm going to start asking people if you don't do that. So please let me know what's exciting happening in your life we can share with the church. Uh, would you please go with me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for today. Uh, God, I thank you for everyone here this morning and those who aren't, uh, for those traveling, for those sick. Uh, we lift everyone up to you. Uh, God, we thank you for bringing us together. Uh, where we can praise your name and just claim that we belong to Jesus. Father, we belong to you. And Father, because of that, we're free from sin. Uh, God, I pray a blessing over this morning that every song we sing glorifies you and just shouts your name across the earth, not just here, but everywhere. Uh, thank you, Father, for loving us and caring for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. For he is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised 
by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the power and authority, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over by the cross. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have many, many reasons to love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, together from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 21 to chapter 6 verse 2. This comes from the New International Version. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carry the cross love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah Body the bread, 
his blood the wine broken and poured out all for the love the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn a love so amazing a love so Jesus, Messiah, name of the all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescued for sin. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, all our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory. The light of the world, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. Sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah. In the book of 1 Corinthians, there are a lot of problems going on. In, in the first one that kind of gets addressed in chapter 1, people are taking sides and saying, hey, I follow so-and-so, and well, I'm going to follow this person instead because they're, they're better. Towards the end of that chapter, Paul says, hey, guys, think about it. There really aren't that many among you who are really that impressive. There's not many of you wise and noble. The way the world would look at it, Think about who you really are. And he ends up by trying to say, you know, if you're going to boast, let it be in the Lord. It's not who we are, it's who Jesus is. That leads into chapter 2, and he says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, so your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Paul's saying the message that we have is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that drives everything else. He talks about a whole lot of stuff through the rest of that book, but he says this all boils down to Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I think that's why it's important that every week we come together, we take some time and just stop and reflect on Jesus Christ and him crucified. To remember him, remember what he did. 
as, as he hung there on the cross, taking my sin upon himself, the sin that I deserve, the punishment that I deserved, the separation from God that I deserve. As he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's my sin that is separating. And Jesus chose to be separated from God, and I don't know how that all works, but he did that out of love for me. And that's, why, that's the message we have, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's at the core. We have been brought together back to God. And nothing else really matters. There's stuff in here to help us understand how to let that play out in our lives. That's what it's all about, is how do we bring into our lives that recognition of Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we're going to take a moment now and reflect on how he gave his body for us, and in that taking my sin, your sin, upon himself. Let's pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we know that sin results in punishment. It's the way you designed it. And yet, you so graciously and mercifully allowed that punishment to be placed upon Jesus instead of us. We didn't deserve that, but you did it because of your love for us. We just thank you for that. Help us now as we take this bread to, to remember what Jesus did for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Join me in prayer for the cup, please. Fathers, we, we think about how you sent your son, that through his blood there's a new covenant, that we're your people now, and that you're our God, and that we have that assurance, and, and that, that's not just something that's now, but it's, it's for all eternity, that we're just, we're just getting started now on an eternity with you because of, of your love for us. Help us remember Jesus and what he did in, in bringing that about. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, holy and anointed one, Jesus, your name is like honey on my My feet, Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Jesus. Spirit like water 
Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <laughs> this is our, our chance now to think about giving, and there's boxes in the back, or some of you do it online. But what Jesus is talking about here is even broader than that. He says, it's when, you're, when you take what you have and put it into kingdom stuff. It's not just giving it, that helps, but it's when that's what your investment is instead of keeping it and hoarding it for you. Then your heart goes there. And so if you find yourself sometimes saying, well, how can I draw closer to God? How can I make my walk with God better? One thing is start taking what you have and putting it in kingdom stuff. Start using what you have for God instead of yourself, and your heart will move toward God. Since we have a chance now, again, to speak about giving, let's keep that in mind. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you've blessed us way beyond what we can stop and reflect on. We're just overwhelmed with, with your blessings to us. And we just ask you to help us use this in your work be involved and in, in have our hearts aligned with serving you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. My best friend, Jesus is my best friend. Jesus is my best friend. I am not alone. No, I am not alone. My best friend. Jesus is my best friend. Jesus is my best friend. I am not alone. My rock. Jesus is my rock. Jesus is my rock. I am not alone. No, I am not alone. My rock. Jesus is my rock. Jesus is my rock. I am not alone. My best friend. Jesus is my best friend. Jesus is my best friend. I am not alone. No, I am not alone. My best friend. Jesus is my best friend. Jesus is my best friend. I am not alone. Let's all stand and sing this song. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. 
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand again. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Please be seated. Good morning yet again, church. Uh, I've said it before, and I will say it again. What an honor and blessing it is to be with you this morning. Uh, however, I stand before you today a little anxious, because this is my first official attempt at a part two of a series. And I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware, but in my opinion, uh, the most pressure in a series or a trilogy or anything with more parts is part two. Uh, I think there's a very delicate balance of part twos. Uh, so to kind of loosen up and to kind of explain what I mean, uh, I'll use my favorite medium, which is movies. We'll start with Star Wars, for example. Anyone like Star Wars, Star Wars fans? The first one came out in the 70s, great movie. Groundbreaking for visual effects and sound. However, part two came out. And the common consensus among people, and especially critics, is that the second one was better than the first. Which is good for Empire, not so much for the original. Because uh, the same is also said for the opposite direction. Indiana Jones, Lost Ark, anyone like that movie a lot? Yeah, great movie, groundbreaking. <laughs> Action adventure, Harrison Ford, love it. Uh, but the second one, part two, came out, Temple of Doom, and the common consensus among people, and especially critics, is that it was worse than the first, which is not good for anybody. Uh, but Oh, amen, that was an amen over there, yikes. <laughs> Uh, but also speaking of Spielberg and Lucas, the producer, directors, that takes us to The Land Before Time, a beloved kids movie. Anyone seen that? Yeah? Uh, and the problem with their part two is that I'm not sure they knew when to stop. They made 14 of those movies so far. And here's the deal. I know it's for kids. That's all fine. But how long can you take that before you get Land Before Time and what's that giant falling rock in the sky? But we probably shouldn't talk about that this morning. That's not the point. Uh, and it seems that some part twos are even just there to cause controversy among people. For example, The Lion King. The Lion King... 
this isn't going to be good. The Lion King is a great movie. In fact, some people say it's the best Disney movie ever made. It's made during the Disney Renaissance, where he's making these original music, powerful movies. And some say it's the best Disney movie ever made. However, until a little movie, in my opinion, came along called Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Is anybody with me? Anyone say Lion King 2 is better? My wife, the, my rock, the woman God gave me, that's right. But do you see why there's tension on part two? Because there's a lot of pressure. The balance of part twos is kind of off sometimes. But there are some movies that get it right. In my opinion, Sister Act. <laughs> Sister Act is one of my favorite movies of all time. Great in its own right. But then Sister Act 2 came out, and it was a continuation of the story the characters and their arcs, it was great. In fact, the title alone is the greatest title on the planet. <laughs> Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, is a Shakespearean level of wordplay. I think it's brilliant. Or we can talk about Lord of the Rings, my other favorite movies of all time, where again, it's, it's a continuation of the story. You don't really compare these movies because they're all so epic and perfectly balanced. That's why I'm anxious this morning, because part two is a big deal. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to just say that to kind of loosen up and uh, see where you're at concerning Lion King 2, which I guess I'm very wrong about, but I want to talk about uh, putting that thought on the back burner for a little bit. The idea of a continuation of a good story, a good sequel, a part two. So hold on to that thought as we start this morning. This brings us to the title this morning is Part 1, Part 2. Part 1 is a series we started talking about the very basics of what we believe. Last week was Part 1, Part 1. We just talked about God. There is a God and he is. That's all we focused on, the simple basis of our belief. So this morning, part one, part two, we go again to the, the basic, the next huge tenet of our faith is the Son. We know him as Jesus Christ. We call him the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, the Lion of Judah, the name above all names. We've been singing about him all morning and it's such a powerful, what a beautiful name it is. And when we go to the basis of this, we find all these challenges that it, it seems so simple. We get it. We've heard all the verses. We know the story. But when you apply them in your life, it is the most challenging and most mystical and most mysterious, fascinating things. So this morning we start in John chapter 1. John 1. And if you want to read along, I encourage that. But if you aren't, I want you to close your eyes and just listen to this. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives life to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. I'm tempted yet again to sit down, because it doesn't get much better than that concerning part one, part two, the basics. But we can expand a little bit on a few things to get down to boiling down the essence of this incredible story. So we start with this idea of the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And I'm going to whip out some Greek, so prepare yourself. I usually don't do this, but this is important. Uh, the Greek for the, for the Word is logos, meaning Word. When used normally, it just means Word. 
But John is writing in a very different sense here. When he uses this word, that's why it's capitalized. When he says, in the beginning was the logos, he's encapsulating this idea that everything that we can understand about God, in fact, the, the way that creation was made was through this word, through this logos, and he says this right here, the word was with God and was God. Logos, encapsulating all of those ideas, that everything that God made was through the word. This part of God that we can actually understand this part of God that we can actually kind of be with and understand. In fact, in, in layman's terms, it's the actual word we might be able to read concerning God. Because we can't fathom all of God, but we can understand the word because the word is meant to be read. So hold that in your mind, that the, the word became flesh. That's the next part. The word became flesh. We know him as Jesus Christ. This is usually where we say, Merry Christmas. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and, and was born in a manger in Bethlehem to Mary. We know that story very well. But this is where I have the most questions of the word coming down and becoming flesh. And you may think it's like these really deep philosophical, theological questions. I never start there. Did Jesus have a favorite food? That's the first question I think of when he was a baby. Did he have a least favorite food? In fact, if, if he ever spat food out as a kid, would Mary be offended or would God be offended because he made all the food in the first place? See, those are the questions I go through. It's not a good place to be if you want to be theological. But the more serious questions I think of are this. If he took on flesh like us, became an actual human, did he have nightmares growing up? That Mary had to rush in or Joseph had to rush in and comfort baby Jesus? Did they have him grow on the doorpost and put little marks about how tall he was getting? Did he ever try to bring home a pet that he wasn't supposed to have? Those are questions that I have because when Jesus became flesh, that means he became like one of us. And we had all that kind of stuff happen. It's so mysterious to think that the very Son of God, the Word, that we can understand God became flesh. And if that weren't enough, that's incredible on its own. But the next part's even more incredible. He dwelt among us. He dwelt and again, language is important. The same language used here to describe this is used in the Old Testament when God commanded the tabernacle to be built so that he could dwell among his people. The same word used there is the one here. So in the Old Testament, God commands because he wants to dwell among his people. In fact, tabernacle is used as a verb there, to tabernacle, to set, a, to set up a tent. Old Testament, God is dwelling in the tabernacle so the Israelites can kind of know in general where he is. But now in the New Testament... The Son of God is tabernacling among us and walking around as one of us and experiencing life as one of us. And if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, the fact that the Son of God, God himself embodied as a son coming to earth, the word becoming flesh and making his dwelling among us, even more incredible is he's bringing an understanding we couldn't fathom because of that. He's bringing a level of understanding concerning God that we can't even come close to fathoming. Because for the first time in history, mankind could point at the Son of God. They could point directly at him. They could make eye contact, look him in the eyes and say, because of you, we can better understand God. Because of you, the word that came down and dwelt, because of you, we can better understand God. But even more miraculously and more mysteriously, Jesus could point at you. And he could say, because of God... I better understand you. Think about that for a second. We can point at him and say, because of you, we can understand God. And he points to you and says, because of God, I understand you. And make no mistake, God didn't need to know us any better than he already did. He knows us more than he could possibly fathom the pain and all the things that we go through. He understands better than anyone possibly could. But now as a person, as a human being, he can point to you and say, I get you. Because everything you're experiencing, I've experienced to the 10th degree. That's where I'm at. Don't think it was easy for Jesus to say no to temptation. He was actually tempted by things and had to turn them down. And where we fall short and fall into those temptations, he stood strong. But he showed us we can do that kind of thing. Because he wants to show you what God's like. An understanding that is so important to have of who God is. So when we have troubles trying to find God and feel God's presence, all we have to do is point to him on earth. Say, here he is. Look at how he treated people. Look how he changed people's lives and saved them and performed miracles. All the kind of stuff that we don't have time to talk about. In fact, in the Gospels, the author writes, we don't have time. There's not enough book space to write down everything that he did. 
There are enough Sunday mornings in the entire timeline of history to talk about all that Jesus has done because he brought understanding. And another thing he brought down to bring is balance. So at the beginning of service, I want you to go back to that back burner and take that thought back about a good part two, a balance of part two. Because in part one, part one last week, we talked about God and he is. We talked about how he put down a law in front of his people and said, if you follow this law, I'll be with you for all generations. Follow this law. And his Israelites, his people did so and they, they were all the way down here. And it wasn't because the law wasn't perfect because God wasn't perfect because he put it down for a good reason, but it got to the point where because of people, the law wasn't cracking it anymore. So in the biggest move of balance, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and said, I'm not here to destroy the law. I'm here to fulfill it. I'm bringing balance back because the law can't be done forever, but I'm coming here to show you why it's in place. I'll bring balance to your life so you don't have to worry about the law. All you have to worry about is following me and you will be the law. To love one another to put everyone else above ourselves, to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. That's the balance he wants to bring. The word became flesh and dwelt among us so we could follow him and find balance in our life again. And think about the people he interacted with. We focus so much about when Jesus comes down to talk to the Pharisees who had the law, but they weren't doing it right. They constantly talk about how you guys look good on the outside, but on the inside, it's terrible what you guys are doing. So he wanted to bring them back to balance in the middle, using the law for what the purpose is to be close to God. And he went to this side of people, the people that we don't really hang out with. He came to the prostitutes and the sinners and the, the tax collectors and all those people that people did not associate with and said, you guys don't have the law, let me introduce it to you so you can be like me and bring them into the middle for balance. So he didn't come just to scold these. And he didn't come just to accept all these lifestyles. He said, no, we're both going to change. Meet me in the middle and find balance. So the same challenge goes to us. May we never think that we're so right to the point that we miss the balance. May we never think that everything is acceptable because we're also going to miss that balance. But if we go to the middle where Christ is, we find balance because that's what he came to bring an understanding of God, and balance to a world that was completely unlevel. Imagine the word becoming flesh, dwelling among us, and that's an incredible moment, and that's the basis of our faith. One more we'll go to is John 3.16. Uh, it is probably a verse that you know, and it might very well be the first verse you ever learned. Uh, I think I still see it sometimes at sporting events, people hold up signs of John 3.16 on it. Because it's a perfect summary of the gospel. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Period. I could sit down and be happy with that. For God so loved the world, he loved the world in this way, that he sent down his son so that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, but have eternal life. That's part one, part two. However, my favorite part about this verse is also the context where it's at. See, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a doctor of the law, and he's talking about how unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. And this guy's confused, saying, how can he be born again? And they go through all that, that discourse. But there's a special part especially in verse 9. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things? I'll tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people don't accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be filled up, lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. He mentions the story in Numbers. It is a fascinating story where the Israelites again are kind of grumbling against God. And they say, why'd you bring us out here if we're just going to die in the wilderness, not trusting him? So God sends venomous snakes into the camps. And snakes start biting the Israelites and they start dying. And they, they go to Moses saying, we, we need help. Please pray to God and get these snakes away from us. And God says, what you're going to do is you're going to make this snake 
a statue, a sculpture, you're going to raise it up. And if people just look at the sculpture, if they look at the snake, they're not going to die. Just look at it. That's all you have to do. If you get bit, just look, and you're going to be fine. He's referencing that story because in the same way he says, in the same exact way, the Son of Man is going to be raised up. And if you just look, look at where he is, being crucified and raised up. If you just look and believe and see the venom of the world, the painful bites, the things that we call darkness will not end in your death because you're looking. You're looking at light, at the life being raised up to just look in his direction and believe that's all you have to do. Believing by giving your life over. Belief by baptism, whatever you want to call it. Believing and giving your entire life to this one thing being raised up where there's no more pain for you because your life will not end in death. He keeps on talking about that. Then it goes to the famous verse, for God so loved the world. Then it keeps on going in 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. To me, that's ironic because he says the same thing to find life that we tell the people who are dying, go towards the light. In those moments, we say, go towards the light, go into the light. And that's what we say to people who are dying. But he says, if you want to live, go towards the light. Go towards the light. The light at the end of the tunnel is what we should be striving for every single day. And it's terrifying because when we get there, people see what we are. They see our misdeeds. They see our hypocrisy. They see the things that make us sinners. But we're standing in the light. And I love what happened Wednesday night because Kalia got baptized. It was so awesome. And Jordan asked her one question, just said, who is Jesus and what do he do for you? Her answer, and I quote, was, he is my savior He saved me from my sins. Perfect. That's part one, part two summed up. He's our savior and he saved us from our sins because he was raised up and all we had to do was look and believe. That's it. Those are the stakes. That's all you have to do is believe and not only that, but step into the light. And yeah, the world will see you for where we are. That's why we confess that we are sinners. Like Paul said when he wrote of sinners, I am the chief, I'm the worst. To which I say, no, 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 I'm the worst. I'm very much a sinner. I like Lion King 2 better than the first Lion King, and I guess that's a deal breaker for a lot of people. But not just that, there's so many sins that I commit in my life where I have to go to the light and say, here I am, full of sin. So we take ourselves to the next part of the verse in this morning in 2 Corinthians 5.14. The ministry of reconciliation. This is where Paul's writing about the difference between what Jesus Christ came to do and what God is doing through him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, We regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Part one, part two. He made him who knew no sin, who was spotless, to become sin. All of our spots God put on him when he was raised up. All my spots were on there. And there's a ton, by the way. 
But because he was raised up, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, was tabernacling among us, lived like us, lived as one of us, but then was raised up. So you could just look at all your spots being washed. It's incredible to think that we have this simple base plan, John 3.16, which again, we know like the back of our hands. But let us never get tired of hearing that verse. Let's never get numb. Like, yeah, we get it. We know this verse. We think about it for a second. All of our spots being washed away because he was raised up. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. That hasn't changed today. Now is the time of God's favor where Christ came and fulfilled every prophecy he needed to and dwelt among us and died for us. Not only that, he was raised to life again. Part one, part two. So the question goes to you this morning. Are you having a hard time finding out who God is? Are you having a tough time feeling his presence? Are you having a hard time finding it in your life and finding who to emulate and what to do? If so, look at the sun. Go into the light. Let everyone see what's going on in your life, but know by going towards the light, you're living a brand new life, a different creation because he was raised up and you looked and you stepped towards it. If you have any problems this morning, any prayer requests that you need, the elders will be around the room to help you with that. If you want to come forward this morning and talk to the elder up here with prayer requests because life is hard, those painful, venomous bites from the world keep on coming. But as long as you look towards the light, it will not end in death. And one more part about this morning especially, because you talk about the, him, him coming down and, and him dying and him being resurrected, but may we not forget, make no mistake, he is coming back. Don't forget. And I hope it's today. And tomorrow, I hope it's tomorrow. But in the meantime, go towards the light. Look, it's free. He is coming back. So if there's any problem among the church, if you have any prayer requests you need, any sins you want to confess, any issues you have, the chances this morning for you to go talk to an elder, come forward, and don't waste this opportunity because the day of salvation is near. God's favor has happened. He was raised up so we could also be raised up. So with that, let's stand and sing. I heard the old, old story How a Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. Oh,
he is built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angel singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. morning church family it's a blessing to see you all here this morning uh, if you are visiting with us we're excited you're here uh, we hope you will take a, a few minutes at the end of our service to stick around so we can get to know you and you can get to know us and we hope you'll return at any opportunity uh, that you have I don't have much in the way of announcements uh, this morning but we do have as usual on your handout a list of uh, friends and relatives who are suffering from uh, cancer or loss of loved one or a physical ailment of some type. We just pray that we will uh, keep those folks on our uh, prayer warrior chart uh, for this week. Um, there is one correction on the, uh, on the list at the top of the page. Ann Clark's uh, pacemaker procedure for tomorrow has been postponed to a later date, so keep that in mind. Thank you, Caleb, for part two this week. And if you were here last week, you heard part one, part one. <laughs> uh, and last week, Caleb uh, referenced uh, David and Goliath. And of course, that's a story we all know pretty well. Goliath was a giant of a man, and he was ready for battle, probably with a helmet, a shield, a sword, and maybe a club or two. And in short, he was a very intimidating, and frightening figure, but not for David. Because as we know, David had God on his side. But think how this story uh, could be a parable for our lives. What is the Goliath in your life? Could it be a class at school? Could it be a big deadline or a project coming up at work? Could it be a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, a pornography addiction? a loss of a loved one. Whatever Goliath you have in your life, God has your back. David was just a shepherd boy armed with only a slingshot and a few rocks. And there's no way he could have taken down this giant Philistine warrior by himself. But there it is, he wasn't by himself because God had his back. You may not have a Goliath in your life right now, but someday you will, we all will. And as you prepare to meet that Goliath, remember, as Caleb had to say last week, there is a God, and he's got your back. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Dear God, our Father, I just want to say thank you so much for this uh, beautiful morning you've given us here, and for everyone who's made the choice to be here, to sing songs of praise, and to worship your name. Father, we are humbled by your presence because we know that... Uh, as we gather here, that you are with us. Father, we're thankful for, uh, to see John and Jan with us this morning after their, um, Jan's broken leg and, and John's a car accident. We ask that you be with each and every one of the folks listed on our prayer request here and, and keep them um, return to their health and just be with them, give them strength and just watch over them as, as only you can. Father, we know that at various times in our lives, we will face our own Goliath, maybe an issue we have to deal with, an addiction to battle with, the loss of a loved one, or, or uh, any number of problems that can pop up, 
seemingly on a daily basis. But Father, as we confront this Goliath, we know that you are there with us, that you are fighting for us. Father, it's through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Thank you, James. Powerful stuff. Now, my, uh, my battery died about halfway through the service, so I've been having to stay here. This is not like me, but I've stayed put behind the podium. But I got to thinking, how many of us have had our, our batteries die in our lives? And I'm not talking about your car battery or your battery in remote control car or vehicle. But how many are in so much pain? Or you're sick. Cancer's got you. Maybe the devil's got you. And you feel like your battery is dead. I love that analogy that Caleb gave. With as a snake was lifted up in the desert, so must the son of man be lifted up. That Jesus is the cure. And that when we are hurting and when we are in pain and when we need our battery recharged, Jesus supplies. Let's stand and let's shout to the Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. Thank you. 
God, we shout to you that nothing compares, nothing at all in all this, this earth and all the things that we're going through, the promises that you have, the promises that you have given us, we can stand on because you have all authority and all power and all might that nothing can stand against Jesus Christ. And God, may we stand today. May we stand firm in those promises. May we stand firm in you because we know that nothing can separate us from the love it is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.